My love for the city is why I uh, wake up early, I stand up here, face my anxieties around public speaking, and uh, also stand here in front of all of you, and it's hopefully to bring you uh, the passion that I feel for Creative Mornings, but also the passion that we feel for this city and that our speakers feel for this city. So you'll have to pardon me in my notes this month. Uh, I'm without my slides, so I'm a little bit running off what I've written down already. Uh, so who has not been to a Creative Warnings before? Please raise your hand. Oh wow, that's a lot of people, wonderful. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, I hope we see you again. Just so you know, Creative Mornings is a monthly event, so it's actually hosted in 173 cities across the world. Uh, and it's a monthly event with a monthly theme, so every th month we talk about something different. Uh, we bring on a new speaker and we invite you to a new venue. You're all so quiet. <laughs> it's making me extra nervous. All right. <laughs> So like I mentioned, Creative Mornings has been around since uh, 2012, so we've been here for five years. Um, and we're just sharing the spirit, the creative spirit of our city. And I don't believe that creative Ottawa is boring. I don't believe that Ottawa is not creative. And I think that it's the same in the room here. What do you all think? Excellent. So, like I said, we're really glad to be here in the new improved uh, NEC. As you can tell, we're in this beautiful glass atrium. This is called the City Room. Uh, the NEC has also a lot of new performance spaces. It offers a lot of new spaces for uh, city events such as this. And it's also fully accessible, which is awesome. So we're, I'm very proud to invite uh, Mary to the stage to kind of give us, give us a little talk um, about the NEC and what you can look for in terms of new programming. Hi there. Welcome everybody. It's uh, great to see you here. Um, as, uh, as you've heard, this is a, a really wonderful new space and we're all still getting used to it here at the NEC. You come in here, I think a lot of us, my colleagues uh, and myself, we come in during the day and just think, wow, natural light. C'est fantastique. Uh, this is something we haven't had at the NEC for a while. Um, for those of you who get the Ottawa Citizen at home, uh, or if you read the Ottawa Citizen, there's a wonderful magazine uh, that came in there today. Uh, and it's got a big feature uh, about Heather Gibson, who is the uh, executive producer of NEC Presents. And she is heading up uh, community engagement here at the NEC. And what we want to do is really bring people into this space and say, this belongs to you. This is a public space. This is for you. C'est vraiment pour tout le monde. So we really watch and see. There will be uh, all kinds of events that are going to be happening here during the day, not just in the evening. So we want you to not think of this place as just a, a spot where you come at night to see a show. It's a place where you can come enjoy the Wi-Fi, uh, meet a friend, enjoy the views, and, uh, and see what's going to be going on. There'll be free performances, there will be talks, there will be all kinds of fascinating things happening here. So we're really looking forward to you all moving in and, and all of Ottawa moving in and making this really your home. Um, I'm here today to just talk to you a little bit about a group that does a little bit of this kind of stuff called the Southern Club. Um, Je travaille avec un, un, un groupe nommé le Club Sodom et il s'adresse à une nouvelle génération des gens qui veulent se rassembler au moyen des arts et de la culture. So the Southern Club, and I see some Southern Club members here, Corianne Bell, hello. Um, it's a group that is a young professionals group and we do all kinds of events at the NAC and it's about coming together over the arts. So les événements sont vraiment fantastiques. We have parties and backstage spaces. We've gone into the NAC kitchen and made a four course meal with the chef and the cooks. Um, later this year, we're gonna have a party in the shop and Victoria Steele, who is a uh, former managing director of English theater who's here today knows what that is. It's a massive space where the sets are made for shows. So we're going to have a party back there. So these are the kinds of really unique experiences you can have at the Southern Club. Uh, le 10 octobre, on va avoir un, un événement avec Heather Gibson, uh, la productrice du Siena Présente, and Sarah McDougall. And that's going to be in the brand new fourth stage. So we've been talking about this new building. The fourth stage is a venue I'm sure many of you know, but it's going to be incredibly beautiful and uh, an incredibly great space after these renovations are complete and that opens next week. So before we see Sarah McDougall, who's a singer-songwriter from Whitehorse, uh, we are going to have a talk with Heather Gibson and Alan Neal from All in a Day. And she's going to talk about her career in music in Canada and the music industry. She's a veteran music producer from Halifax. And she's going to talk about the new building and, and everything that's going to be happening here in the new NEC. So we would love you to join us. If you are a young professional who loves the arts, who loves learning about the arts, who loves uh, 
coming together and meeting interesting people, the Southern Club is really a place for you. You can join online, uh, southernclub.ca. We've got some flyers, and uh, we'd love to, to have you join us. So listen, I don't want to hold up the show. Alexandra is here to talk to you. Uh, merci beaucoup, et uh, bienvenue tout le monde aux Nouvelles CNA. Merci. All right, so as you all know, we're here today to talk about the theme of compassion. And as I mentioned previously, our themes are chosen by a global chapter. So this theme was chosen by our Helsinki chapter. And next month, it'll be chosen by somebody else. And eventually, we'll have our turn as well to talk about what we think is important in our city. Uh, so in the theme of compassion, and with all the storms and the earthquakes and all the tragedies that are going on right now, I urge you all to please donate to our uh, Canadian Red Cross. We'll be sharing a link out on our social media about that as well. So just tying in it with the theme, also thinking about our global community that we have. We have a lot of chapters throughout Mexico. We heard from Mexico City as soon as that earthquake had hit and that everybody was fine. So it was a relief, but again, such a beauty with that community is that there was so much support internally there and we just want to make sure that we're doing our part as well. Um, yes, so on to the main event. Uh, don't, oh, don't forget, we're on social media. Please feel free to share this conversation online as well. So the hashtags that we're using, CM Ottawa and CM Compassion. So there's a lot of talks going on today uh, beyond ours, beyond our city that are also talking about compassion. So you can pop over to Twitter, you can see what's going on, what's being said, and you can join on in those conversations as well. So yes, on to our main event. Um, as music director and established conductor, Alexander Shelley knows a thing or two about compassion. It's my pleasure to welcome him to the Creative Mornings Ottawa stage here at the NEC to speak to us about the, his role, the role compassion plays in his life, but as well as his personal career. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Alexander Shelley. Good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you, Maxine. Thank you, Creative Mornings, for inviting me uh, to be here. Um, and thank you. It's a great pleasure to see so many of you here at the NAC. You may hear some drilling and um, some shouting and some work going on, because even though it's officially open and finished, it's not finished at all. Um, <laughs> it looks amazing, and we're loving every minute of the new building, but sometimes we're in there in rehearsals where we're in an incredibly soft passage, and we're trying to refine the sound as much as possible, and then we <clears throat> from upstairs. So it's Definitely not uh, completely finished, but I do hope, and I and I and I, I want to share that. I just hope that this becomes a space for everybody who lives here in Ottawa, because it really is beautiful. Even just the the views out here are special, and and it's also our hope that. Uh, when you're in the building, you'll sometimes be aware of what's happening in terms of rehearsals, how we prepare music and how we work and, and what's behind the scenes before you see the end product. And I'll talk a little bit about that today. Um, compassion. It's an interesting one. We're not doctors, we're musicians, we're not psychologists, uh, we don't work for the Red Cross, uh, we're not out there uh, in earthquake zones or places where people need immediate help. So when I was uh, invited to do this and was given the subject matter, I had to think, okay, well, compassion in the, in the broader sense, compassion in the sense of engaging with other people, empathizing, but then going that step further and saying, okay, how do we reach out and help other people as musicians? And uh, in terms of how I'd like to approach talking to you this morning, I think uh, there'll be a sort of structure of talking a little bit about what a conductor does, because normally when I tell people that that's what I do, they say, okay, which bus route are you on then? <laughs> and I say, well, that's not quite the kind of conductor I am. Um, but it's, it's a, a profession that is still shrouded a little bit in mystery. Uh, so I think I might spend the first few minutes just talking to you a little bit about what my day looks like, uh, how I prepare music and how I engage with an orchestra. I was just roughly doing the sums here. This sitting in front of me is a roughly like either one big orchestra or one and a half medium sized orchestras. So um, we, we're normally around 70 people, up to 100 people in a, in a symphony orchestra. Um, I'm not sure exactly how many you are, but it, I would guess that it looks about, a bit like that. And how I uh, engage with those people, and of course, as a music director, as the, the, the boss of certain, I go also as a guest conductor, I'll talk to you this about, about this, but uh, as the boss of, of an orchestra, um, the idea of compassion, engaging with the people I work with um, and understanding what's happening in their lives when they're trying to produce their absolute best, which every orchestral musician does. Compassion, of course, plays a role there. But I'd like then to talk a little bit about how music, um, in and of itself, even though it's something inherently abstract, 
um, has compassion at its core for many great composers. And I've received very moving, moving letters over the years from people who've come to concerts or been involved in concerts saying, you know what, I was in a very difficult time in my life. And when I heard that piece and I heard that performance, it gave me hope. Uh, so music can actually reach out and help people. But then I'll also like to talk a little bit about um, education projects. There's so much that music can do and does around the world, and I've been privileged to be involved in several of those projects, uh, where we can tangibly go into communities, particularly with young people who haven't got the arts in their lives, and we can bring music, the arts, to them and see tangible results where they, they're facing personal problems and the skills um, that they learn through music have a, a, an enduring effect on their lives. So that's the broad outline. Now you know what's coming your way. You can feel free to leave at any given point uh, if you've heard the bit you want to hear. Um, so, okay, what does a conductor do? Uh, first and foremost, I have to uh, build an intimate and empathetic and, if you will, compassionate relationship with the notes on a page. I have to, if, for example, I'm conducting Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, which we had here last week, I have to analyze that piece. I have to get into the text in the way that uh, a director would need to understand, ideally, all the detail of the rhythm and the structure of a Shakespeare play, because we have all those structures and forms and shapes that are beneath the surface, the DNA of a piece. I have to dig in there, and I spend many, 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 many hours when I first learn a piece doing this kind of analysis. And this analysis leads me to understand the processes that were in the mind of a composer when they were creating uh, the work. And I mentioned Beethoven. Beethoven is, is often taken as an example of the greatest composer because he would take a very simple little bit of musical DNA, ta -ta -ta -dee, and he would, out of that, create a universe that we call a, a symphony. And from the first to the last note, there's not only an emotional connection, the thing that most viscerally hits you when you're in a hall. But there's also a very deep intellectual connection between the first and the last notes. There are other composers who are great creators. They, they write beautiful tunes. But the, the thing we would describe as composition, the craftsmanship of turning an idea into something deeper, not every, every composer has. Beethoven stands for the best example of that. And in fact, those of you... When I was a kid, I, when, a kid when I was 15, I used to love Rich, re, uh, reading Richard Dawkins' uh, books. He, he went kind of a little nuts later and, and, and got very dogmatic. Um, but the original books, many of you will have read Blind Watchmaker and Selfish Gene. And uh, particularly the Blind Watchmaker, when I read it, he talks about modeling um, uh, evolution in computers, putting in little shapes and seeing how they develop. And I, I couldn't help but say, it's so funny. That's basically what composers do. They search around for... for little um, organisms that they'd like to spend a few months with or a few weeks with writing a piece of music. Um, and then they put it into essentially a sort of evolution machine, which is their compositional minds. And at the end, something comes out. So that's what I do. I, I spend my time at a table, many, many hours analyzing this. And, and of course, as in most art and in life in general, um, one, one side, which is the intellectual side, inexorably links to the emotional side. They're not two separate entities. And I think that's also important when, you, when you're uh, thinking about art and you're thinking about interpretation, this word interpretation, um, understanding that that is a dangerous term. Um, for me, interpretation is understanding a work and then trying to be truthful to it. Um, but by virtue of the fact that we're all different and that we'll all pick out different elements when we're analyzing something, our interpretation, if you will, takes an individual form. But the purpose for me of an interpretation should never be, this is mine, but rather, how am I serving the work? So this idea, if you will, of compassion, I think it's probably more at the stage of empathy right now, but is, is a fundamental part of what a musician does. And in fact, it's the first bit of that the conductor does at all, because we're in this strange position that we, we're, we're not playing an instrument. I sit at a table like that, and I just analyze, and try to hear in my head, and try to understand, try to empathize, and find compassion for, for, for what the, uh, the composer was doing. Now, once I've gone through that stage, and that is, I won't 
I, I know that you, you're all kind of probably nerds like me as well. And I, 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 I was told before, hey, don't worry, they're all nerds like you. Because I could, I could go on for a long time talking about this stuff because it really excites me. But it is kind of nerdy. Um, but I, I, I build a, a very strong and for me very meaningful relationship both with the work and the composer at this stage, the table stage. Um, it's like reading a great novel. It's one, of, it's one of the most personal things you can possibly conceive of. And if at the same time uh, you're analyzing it and you're, you're taking it apart as somebody who studied English literature, let's say, then it becomes all the more uh, meaningful to you. So I have that stage. But of course that's not really the, the main work of a, of a conductor. That's more the work of a musicologist. That's the first stage for me. The next stage is I go, like this morning at 10 a.m. I have a rehearsal. And I will go into the hall and sitting there are, what, this morning will be 70 people, it could be any number. Sometimes you have a chamber orchestra, which is a smaller group of 25, 30, sometimes it's 70, sometimes it's 100. It depends on what piece we're playing and how many parts there are. Um, but the musicians will be there waiting for me, and I have to lead a rehearsal. So I, I come in prepared as I have done, uh, with a knowledge of the piece, and normally I'll pick up my baton. We can talk about that at some point as well. People are like, what the hell? is the baton, why do you have a, a wand? Um, maybe for another morning, or if, if you, by the way, there'll be questions at the end. You can happily ask me about the baton at the end. Um, anyway, I pick up my baton, and uh, we will normally immediately start playing and running through a piece. Now, uh, let me just talk about orchestral musicians for a second. And one of the privileges of, of my life and, one, and my, my job, uh, you're average orchestral musician will have started playing their instrument probably at the age of four, maybe five. Um, to get a job in a top orchestra like this, they will be creme de la creme. They'll be top 1% worldwide of instrumentalists, minimum. And they will have spent those years from the age of four to about 24, when they finished uh, university or college, practicing many hours a day, pretty much every day. There's no weekend, there's no, if you want to uh, perform, you have to do it all the time. And um, so delighted Seku Kaba's here, it's great to see you. Uh, from sport, is a very similar thing. Um, at a young age, people have to have developed that kind of ability to work every day from a, from a young age in order to, to get to the level they are. So we have uh, people on stage who have 10,000 hours, the Malcolm Gladwell Canadian, right? Yes. Um, 10,000 hours have been achieved by these people in their early to mid 20s. Um, most of them have done master's degrees, most of them have done second degrees on other instruments as well. So you, you have, even when they're the young musicians in the orchestra, you have people sitting there who are absolute masters of their trade. Um, they've had all the training that you've had, minus a little bit because I specialized in conducting. I also did a degree as an instrumentalist, a cellist and a, and a pianist, and then I went into conducting and did a degree in that. But um, they've had all that training, all the same experience. They've, they've been doing it since they were four as well. Um, and it means that there, is, there can be not a second, but I mean not a second of BS in a rehearsal. Because if a conductor turns up and is not completely prepared, and isn't completely efficient, but I mean 100% efficient with the use of time. These people who've been around this industry since they were four years old will tear you to pieces. And that is something I, I, wish, I wish on no one. But at the same time, forgetting the, the negative side, it is such a, a joy and a privilege to stand in front of people who have that level of expertise and to then work with them in real time. So there are these two, uh, levels. One is the physical side. Now, the, the joy of conducting uh, an orchestra that is working efficiently is also difficult to describe in words. You enter into a physical symbiosis and through that a sonic symbiosis with a group of 70 to 100 people for, in the case of, of the Ninth Symphony, for an hour. And it moves from, I know that the observation when you're sitting outside and you're watching a conductor is the conductor is controlling what's happening. Yes, but also no. Um, it, 
one will not work without the other. If I do this, if I give a downbeat, absolutely nothing will happen unless the orchestra feels the moment with me. And indeed, if they go on strike, they won't do anything at all. Um, but uh, it's a constant give and take. It's, and there's no rule about it. If, for example, we start a, a piece and I lead the, the full orchestra on the downbeat, uh, and I'll give an impulse of energy. That's basically what it comes down to, is, is giving uh, impulses of energy. That will lead to a reaction in the orchestra, which in, get, in turn comes back to me. I can see how they react, like pressing the gas pedal on a car. You know, if you get into a rental and it's kind of non-responsive, you have to push much harder than the car you have at home or a pedal bike or whatever. Um, and it's the same thing from orchestra to orchestra, there'll be a different response. From day to day with the same orchestra, there'll be a different response. So you see how much energy you give. But then we switch from it being the full orchestra over to an oboe leading, having a, a, a melodic line. And again, it depends a little bit on the philosophy of the conductor. You could hold on very tight and give the, the oboist every detail of the timing. But most conductors understand that by doing that, what you're doing is you're reducing the overall capacity for creativity within uh, the orchestra. So a good conductor will have given a framework of the speed in which we're performing, the rough speed, but will in that moment allow the oboist to engage their creativity and their excellence and their, their many, many years of mastery on the instrument and to lead us. So from that, in that movement, I move to, to following. And also through the way I look at the orchestra, the way I change my body language, I'll try and indicate to everyone, let's listen to him or her. And in the next second, it may move to the first horn. And again, in my body language, I'll try and indicate, let's go over here. And then I may need to take control again if it's the whole orchestra performing. Um, and whole orchestra giving those, those impulses. Now, this is, of course, fundamentally empathetic. And when it comes to music that is deeply expressive, it's also compassionate. It's, it's a very beautiful sensation if you, if you know a musician, even if you don't, honestly, but if you know a musician and they have several measures of a, of a solo, and you can hear their souls, their experiences, their moment in time being expressed at that moment. And, and in turn, they're bringing the soul and the life and the experience of the composer to life in that, in that moment. Um, it's something that is fundamentally human and compassionate and empathetic. Um, and is, is, again, one of the highlights of my life. For those of you who uh, maybe have less interest in, in music, um, but are interested in these, in, in what's happening in that process, it is of course deeply applicable to management in general. There are several orchestras around the world that offer uh, courses for uh, for managers to come and observe orchestras, sometimes to come and conduct orchestras, but to work out how they would lead a rehearsal as well. And look at what is happening within the group because I think it's a microcosm of what we'd all wish for in offices. You have highly capable, highly skilled, highly specialized individuals working together in real time uh, in a way, frankly, that, I mean, in the case of an orchestra, it doesn't occur in any other field. So the largest sports teams, I don't know, I can't, I can't think of a sport where you have 20 people on a team, but there probably is one. But you don't have 70 people on a team. Um, and they may have a ball that they pass to one another, and they have to act as an organism. But in the case of an orchestra, they can all have the ball at the same time. And if any one individual gets something wrong, then the edifice can, can crumble. So it's, it's really an example of, of interacting in real time and working as a team in real time like not, no other in the world. And that's why it's, it's often been interesting. I've seen it in, in many different places around the world for, for managers, people who work in companies to come in and observe how, um, how they create these bonds. Now, we're talking about compassion today, and I talked about the, the human side as a, as a leader of an orchestra. Um, these... Uh, these responsibilities on orchestral musicians are acute. So they will have several programs to perform a week. And we're talking about the, the orchestra right now, this morning will rehearse with me a brand new piece that was written just a few weeks ago. So they're seeing this music for the first time. Then a piece by Sibelius. And this afternoon they, they rehearse a piece called The Rite of Spring by Stravinsky. It's a very, very challenging piece. Last week we did Beethoven's Ninth and a couple of other uh, uh, smaller uh, but serious pieces. And earlier in that week, we rehearsed several symphonies and four contemporary works. And they have to have all of the notes under their fingers. And these are very, very demanding pieces. And they can't make mistakes in the group. It's, it's interesting. It, there's, a, there's a tolerance because they're also 
tight-knit. There's a tolerance if one person makes a mistake. But you can see people thinking, hmm. <laughs> because of course, if 70 me people make a mistake, just every rehearsal unit, and we, we'll, we'll do about an hour and five minutes, hour and 10 minutes and take a break. If 70 me people make one mistake, playing thousands and thousands of notes, that's 70 mistakes in the course of an hour, and you hear them, and it affects everybody immediately. Um, so we have very, very, very low tolerance for mistakes. It's not because we're just, it's just you can't make many mistakes as orchestral musicians. So they're under a lot of pressure. They also will sit, sometimes for 35 years, next to the same person. <laughs> so you play the clarinet, and uh, you're the first clarinet. Right here is the second clarinet. 10 o'clock every morning, same lady, same guy, whatever, sitting there. And if you have a bust up in the first six months of your relationship, you've got 34 and a half years afterwards <laughs> to get over it. And, and this is not a joke. I know of orchestras, and I've worked with orchestras, where people have said to me, first and second clarinet haven't spoken a word to each other for 20 years. <laughs> They just come in, they do their thing, go home. Now, of course, that's not ideal. And as a conductor and somebody who um, has to uh, lead the orchestra in terms of their, their longer-term lives and also the daily, day, uh, daily issues of, of how they interact with one another, which come up more when you're there as music director than if you're there as a guest, um, you have to develop a, a, a strong degree of compassion for, for what they're going through and understand these, these pressures that you're asking someone on the one hand to perform to their absolute upper limit, um, but at the same time realize that sometimes their kids are not having a good time at school or the washing machine's broken or more severe things can happen. And you have to help them to, to work through that while, while, of course, keeping the greater organism of the orchestra um, in mind. Anyway, from that point of view, it's not, like, it's not different from anything else in life, but it is it's something that's a, it's a large part of the work I do and also how I try and lead the orchestra. Because on the one hand, you have the stick as a conductor, literally. Um, on the other hand, is the carrot. And personally, because music is such an intimate and, um, yes, emotional uh, experience, and because we do have to, as a team on stage, wear our hearts on our sleeves, if we're truly going to communicate with you, our audience. I feel that the people within the orchestra need to have the lines of communication open. So shutting down and saying, I'm not going to talk to this guy, or I'm just going to turn up and do my thing. It would work. You know, you can play the notes, you can, but an audience senses uh, that. And within the orchestra, it has an immediate effect. If there's tension, uh, it makes it very difficult to discuss openly things that are delicate, because we're talking, as I said, about people trying to achieve things that are hard. So anyway, that's compassion in my uh, sort of uh, daily life as a, as a, as a conductor with, with the orchestra. Um, just a brief, I said I'd give you a quick outline of what I do. So I'm here about 17 weeks a year as music director of the NEC Orchestra. Uh, roughly 12 weeks of those, or no less than 12 weeks of those, I'll be conducting the orchestra. Um, and another five weeks will be um, going out in the community, doing education, uh, having meetings in different parts of the country to build uh, the relationships with the NAC, meeting uh, donors uh, and patrons, doing talks in the morning like this, um, and, uh, and generally being part of the life of the orchestra. My responsibility for the NAC orchestra is the um, long-term artistic development of the orchestra. So having a vision of where I'd like the orchestra to go, how I'd like the orchestra to sound, what repertoire the orchestra performs, and having ultimate responsibility for, for which artists are invited to work with us. Now, as with the orchestra, we have a big and extraordinary team, many of whom are here today. So I don't have direct responsibility for those things. I have ulti ultimate responsibility. If something's going wrong, yes, it's my fault. But there's a big team who engage artists, who, who, uh, who work in our extraordinary education department, and so on and so forth. Um, and it's incredibly rewarding, but I have this strange, this strange uh, element of my life that I actually uh, then go somewhere else um, and do the same thing in other places. So I've just finished eight years um, as music director of the Nuremberg Symphony Orchestra, where I did precisely the same thing, two years overlapped with Nuremberg. And I'd spend about 10 to 12 weeks a year in Nuremberg. 
I have a position with the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra, it's called Principal Associate Conductor of the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra, uh, which means that I have a, a series of concerts in London that I curate, so I'm responsible for the programming uh, of those concerts, um, and then I conduct them, and I tour also with the Royal Philharmonic to different uh, places, as I do with, with this orchestra and with the Nuremberg Symphony. Now, when I'm not with those orchestras, and I've finished in Nuremberg now, so 17 weeks here, five weeks with the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra, when I'm not there, I go and do what's called guest conducting. Now, the best uh, I think the best way to imagine this is if you take the, the coach of the Sens and you imagine that once, uh, once a month or so he goes to another team and coaches them for a game. That's what conductors do. It's very weird and polygamous and slightly naughty, but that's what we do. And of course, the, the great danger is that is that if someone comes here while I'm away and they're amazing, <laughs> and the audience goes, he's amazing or she's amazing, I'm like, hold on, maybe I shouldn't leave too much. But anyway, it, it's actually very, very healthy for orchestras to not have the same person there every week. Because um, what I demand of them, what I'm asking of them, uh, sometimes needs to percolate and also having fresh ideas, having someone come in who has a completely different approach to, to certain repertory is, is hugely useful and it's something that one needs to not feel uh, is, is an issue at all. In fact, we don't. We don't think twice about it in, in our industry. When I go and conduct a, an orchestra as a guest, I listen to the way they produce sound, I listen to, to, to the way they work with one another, I look at the social elements of how, how many hours do they rehearse, when do they rehearse, what kind of uh, support systems are in place for the musicians, how do they interact with their audience, what are the models for giving concerts. And I bring that back with me. And anything that's good I share with our team and I try and impart to the orchestra. So that's roughly how my life works, if you were wondering. Um, now, I wanted to talk, uh, I, I hope I'm okay for time, I tend to witter on. Uh, yeah, um, I just wanted to talk about um, the social element of music because um, I've been uh, very fortunate from, from actually a pretty young age to have been uh, involved in some extraordinary projects and to have seen firsthand how music, the arts, and perhaps uh, for, for this context as well, to put it more specifically, a certain way of engaging with young people can be incredibly beneficial to them. Now, it started for me when I was around uh, 19, 18, I went to Germany to study and um, I founded an orchestra there and after a couple of years of sort of building the orchestra, we, we, we started a series of concerts which, is exp which was explicitly conceived for um, people of our age then, we were 20, so we had really cool uh, guest artists, uh, all, loads of different things, poet, DJs, um, jazz musicians, everything, and all walks of life would come as guests, perform with us, we'd add uh, classical music around it, and we call the, the series 440 Hertz because it's a unifying concept within all musical genres that we all have to tune, and randomly, it's not random, again, that's a long story, but 440 Hertz is taken as the, as the A that people tune to. It's sometimes 442 and 444, and it used to be way lower, but it doesn't matter. Anyway, <laughs> so I did that, and, and we built a relationship with a great audience of our own age. As I said, when we were 20, we'd have parties after. It was very cool, and, and um, in a very different way to what I'm about to, to, to talk about, I could see how, how music was... There's, there's nothing... In, I mean, I hope you know this. It, it makes me sick when everyone, anyone says this there's nothing inherently elitist about classical music at all, quite the opposite. It's just sometimes there's, there's the tradition of it being presented in a way that makes people feel a little bit standoffish. But, and again, that's something that would be worth, I would talk about that way too long as well. So I'll just skip that. But um, when I was around 25, I started working with an orchestra called the Deutsche Kammerphilharmonie Bremen, so the German Chamber Philharmonic Bremen. And uh, uh, I went along and did a, a, a dance project with them and um, involved in the dance project were uh, a lot of young people. And uh, this, this piece that we, can I take a sip of my coffee? <laughs> I don't function very well without it, especially, one of the reasons to go into music is not to have to do things at eight in the morning, so. Um, <laughs> but uh, um, I, I went to Bremen, and this project I was invited to conduct it was, was dance. And uh, the piece was by a contemporary Scottish composer called James Macmillan. It was a very, very hard piece of music to play. Um, and I think there must have been about 200 kids between the age of about 10 and 15 who were dancing a choreography. They worked with one of the world's top choreographers on this. Um, and these kids were from the local area in Bremen, uh, a, a place called Teneva Ost, 
which had, at that time, an unemployment rate in the families around 90%. And this was generational unemployment. So kids whose parents didn't work, whose parents hadn't worked, whose parents hadn't worked. Um, and the story of how the orchestra came to be in this area is a long and very interesting one, but they decided off their own bats, and it's a private orchestra, they founded it themselves, they built it themselves. They said, we want to go into an area of town, uh, not where there are lovely big buildings and fabulous halls, we want to go into an area of town where people don't hear music all the time. And they built state-of-the-art rehearsal halls there, and they're still there to this day. Anyway, I went along there, did this, and it was one of those uh, moments in life. I. I observed the kids responding to this music, this very challenging music, and I spoke to them a little bit. I said to them, you know, I'm really impressed because for us classical musicians, this piece is demanding. This is something I, again, I don't know if you're aware of, but when you find pieces demanding to listen to, very often we do too. The difference is that we know, or we feel, because it's kind of part of what we've grown up with, that music is not just about being nice that sometimes people will write pieces that make you feel uneasy precisely because they felt uneasy and they want to express that in music. Just like those films where <laughs> it's not always fun to be scared, but it's also sometimes fun to be scared. It's fun to also watch films, oh, I'm so sorry. you know, you don't just want to be happy when you watch a film or be comfortable. It's the same with music. Anyway, I was saying to these kids, you know, this is really hard music. I'm so impressed. And they went, you know, hmm, yes, we know. And then they danced. And, well, they didn't do the can-can, but they were doing, like, <laughs> complicated contemporary dance. Anyway, so I started this relationship with this, with this, this orchestra. And um, very fortunately, they, they noticed that I also loved that experience. And they invited me back then to, to be the, the artistic director of a thing that they called the Zukunftslabor, so the future laboratory. Sounds bad in German and in English. But, but what it meant was that I was responsible for building projects, engaging the community with the orchestra and vice versa. And specifically, they were based in a school. Now, in the school, they were coming up to, to 1,500, 2,000 uh, students. And one of the projects that we developed was a thing, it would be called the Borough Opera here, Stadtteil Oper. And it was a, a borough opera. And what we would do is we'd get all the kids in the school to work around uh, a theme. The theme changed every year. The first year, we thought, let's just, let's just go all in. So we picked the second book of Faust by Goethe. And we commissioned a composer to work with um, uh, education specialists and uh, a director and dance and movement specialists in the school to develop with the kids a piece, an opera, based on the second book of Faust. Now, during um, the work for this, I would go in once every few months, just for, for, a, for a day, and visit the school to see how things were continuing. And one, I use one example uh, of something that stuck in my mind, and I've seen it in countless other projects where music and the arts have engaged with education. And forgive me if you've ever heard me say this before, because I do repeat it, but I, I remember going in, I was 26, sitting uh, in a classroom, and an excellent movement and uh, acting coach was working with some of these kids. Now, I told you there was, there's a rampant unemployment in this area. There, was, there were also families where, through this unemployment and through many other things, kids had some very difficult relationships with their parents, very difficult homes, which of course meant that when they were at school, they sometimes had great difficulty interacting with other kids. One of these boys, he was, he was kind of, he would just like sit there, he was not engaged in what was happening. Um, everyone else in that, in that particular room was there, Thank you. Uh, everyone else in that room was, uh, was, was sort of engaged in different ways, but he was just not. He, he was demonstrating, I do not want to be part of this. I think it's stupid. Um, and I saw him out of the corner. I thought, okay, how's this guy going to deal with him? Anyway, after a while, he, he asked him to come up, and he said, Phew. and he was sort of walking in circles. But gradually, the, the guy lulled him to up to the center of the room. And he asked him to, to, to do one exercise, which was to stand opposite one of his fellow students and look him in the eyes for 20 seconds, which would seem like nothing, you know? And I've never seen, I've truly never seen a young person or any person squirm as much. He could not hold this, this other uh, guy's uh, uh, stare. It was just not possible for him. And um, there were some arguments, there was some discussion, there was some corralling, but it, it didn't happen. And I went back a few months later 
and they'd continued to work with this 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 boy and I saw some some developments and I went back for the final rehearsals and, and performances um, and we had every time I'd come I, we'd played soccer we'd done things that had kind of built also this sense of, of team and group and so I got to know him a little bit um, but long story short by the end of this process of working calmly on things like looking at someone engaging non-verbally which is the essence of music as well. This happened to be acting, but it's the essence of music. Engaging non-verbally, of saying, look, you can feel comfortable in your skin. And doing musical exercises, doing artistic exercises, acting exercises that built brick by brick some self-confidence in these young people. By the end of this process, it was around eight months, um, this boy stood on stage and he held the gaze of the audience, there must have been 700 people there from his community. We, we did it open air and the community came along. He held their gaze right at the beginning of, of, of Faust II. Um, and he recited lines by Goethe from memory. I guess he had 25 seconds of lines and was completely persuasive. And in fact, his pain, all the challenges that he'd had, made him a really compelling young guy to look at on stage. And he then went on to be very involved in the, in the, the borough operas that we did afterwards. He became a friend of mine, uh, without doubt. We used to play soccer every time. And he's actually made something of his life. He went to university and he's done well. Now that's just one example, and I'm aware that I'm not talking about music right now, and I happen to be talking about acting. But I've seen the same thing uh, happen uh, constantly through music. This sense of empowerment in a language which for a lot of kids is completely new. It's not associated with maths or English or you know, languages or failures that they've had already. It's about saying, when you beat a drum and then hear someone beat another rhythm, beat the same rhythm back to them and then give them a rhythm and they have to beat it back to you. And then we're gonna add another person in the group. And these are simple exercises in communication, in empathy, in compassion. But when you start to build on them, you also start to build confidence uh, in people that they can then take into their languages, their maths, their physics, their biology. These little building blocks um, of confidence and, uh, and simple human interaction. And um, I probably spent too much time talking about the auction, too little time talking about this, because this is uh, an area that is incredibly important. And I, I, I was asked recently by a guy who was visiting. I, there'd been an auction. And uh, I was on the auction. Have you ever had that? I, I, it's, I, I, it's new for me, too. It's weird. Uh, they say, who'd like to have dinner with Mr. Shelley? And I think, please, someone. There's hundreds of people in this room. Please, someone. You know. But anyway, he, this, this guy bid because his wife loves music and, and she's interested in conducting. And they came from Calgary to, to, to have lunch and then come and see the show. And we got on like a house on fire, They're a lo lovely couple, and we actually ended up having dinner afterwards. And he said to me, he, he's gone through some things in his life too. He, he had a, he's a successful businessman, but he had a car crash, and uh, he broke his neck, and he had to come back from them. He lost his emotional memory. He had to relearn to love his wife and children. Um, so he's been through a lot. But he asked me a question. He said, what, what are you most proud of in your life? And I thought, oh, shit. <sighs> but actually, apart from my wonderful... Uh, wife and uh, you know the fact that I have a loving family which I feel very lucky about um, these things these areas where I've been able to take my experience as a musician into education and work with young people are the things I'm genuinely proud of and it's because I can see how it has helped build young people who, who are lacking self-confidence into young people who could go out into the world and 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 you know really do whatever they wanted um, and um, Music, many things, sports, pretty much any subject, but music has a, a, a music and the arts have a, have a great way of engaging with young people. And um, we live in an age where, unfortunately, in schools around the world, um, more utilitarian or overtly utilitarian uh, subjects uh, are being kept in the arts. I understand there's you know, budget cuts, it's difficult, the arts are, are getting lost, but it's a bit of a vicious circle because people miss the fact that within the arts, you learn so much. You learn compassion, you learn empathy, you learn communication, you learn to analyze, you learn what it is to serve a creator, but at the same time to serve an audience and then to lead groups. Uh, you learn all those skills that we look for in, in management, in offices, in fire departments, whatever you will. Um, so anyway, uh, that's a little bit about me. Uh, I don't know if any of you have any questions, but I'm, uh, Maxine looks yeah. furious at me. I think I've spoken <laughs> w way too long. Wow. <laughs> 
No, you keep throwing me under the bus. <laughs> By the way, I never called any of you nerdy. We'll <laughs> talk about that later. Um, if anybody have any, has any questions, please con come on up. Hi. Hi. Alex to Alex. Oh, cool. Hey, um, I thought it was really interesting the way that you talked about getting in the mind of a composer to understand his intentions with a piece. Now, uh, a lot of pieces are written for a specific event. Someone famous dies and they get a requiem or a dirge, you know, a wave of nationalism sweeps Italy and then Birdie writes the score. So I'm wondering, um, as a conductor and, and for the musicians, do you ever study the history of a piece to build compassion for the context and channel that as you perform as well? Absolutely. It's as if I had planted you. I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I actually didn't. Is your name really Alex? It is. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> It's, it's, a, it's a very good question, and, and I'm, I'm glad you asked me that, because uh, the, an the short answer is yes. I don't know if every conductor does it, but they should. Um, now, let me give you an example. I mentioned Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. Um, and this is, this is perhaps also a great work to see the compassion of a composer in, in action. So, Beethoven's Ninth Symphony was written in 1824, and... 1650 roughly to 1800 are the uh, uh, roughly agreed dates of the Enlightenment, where, as you all know, huge progress was made in terms of individual rational thought empowering people in society. We, we're regressing a little bit at the moment. But um, he, in his lifetime, he was, a, he was a passionate supporter of the Enlightenment and Enlightenment ideals. He, he grew up believing in it fundamentally, and in fact, it was a driver for most things he did in life. Um, and by the, the time that 1824 came along, the early 1820s, he saw in his society a regression as well in enlightened thought. And his symphony, the Ninth Symphony, is an answer to that. Um, now, unless you contextualize it like that, you, of course you can play the piece, but you're not really understanding why it came to be. And let me just talk about that piece for a second, because in the first three movements, you have a standard symphonic experience. You have an orchestra. I mean, it's not standard in any way. It's extraordinary. And it goes in with brutish force and anger about the situation. It's an it's, it's incredibly forceful first movement, almost painful. And he flips around the second and third movements. Normally, in a symphony, you'd have a slow second movement and then a scherzo, like a quicker third movement. He flips it around. He goes from this passionate, intense first movement into a passionate, intense scherzo, only then to give you, the audience, a little respite and give you something sweeter. But in the fourth movement, he does something that no composer had ever done before. He, he starts off um, writing a fourth movement with what we call a recitative. You know in an opera, they, like, they sing an aria, and then in a lot of operas up to kind of the early 20th century, they'll, they, they'll then go, well, I thought that was lovely, Cling, and then there's a chord on the harpsichord, and they say, yes, I thought that was lovely too. And then there's a kind of like action. They talk to each other, but in what's called recitative, so it's sort of talking uh, instead of singing an aria, and then they sing another aria. So he wrote a recitative, but for the orchestra, the, the cellis and the basses go tom ti ta da 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 ti ta da 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 ti ti la ti dom. And if it sounds like they're trying to talk to you, it's because they are. That's what it is. Anyway, he goes on with that, and then he comes to the idea of ti 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 because what he wrote in his manuscript above this uh, this cello bass thing. I point there because that's where they sit in an orchestra. <laughs> um, but he wrote actually for himself a text, and he said. He said, like, we need to find a solution to this problem. And he quotes the first movement. Then, he's, then he writes above what he's written for them. He says, no, that's not it, that's not it. Then he quotes the second movement. Then he says, that's still not it, I can't find it. Then he quotes the third movement. And he says, again, I can't find it. Then he goes, and then they answer. And in his manuscript, he wrote, yes, this is it. This is the solution. And then he states that theme, that famous Ode to Joy, once without any voices or anything. And then there's another break in the music. And now, for the first time in the history of symphonic music, a singer stands up. That had never happened in a symphony before. In the opera, yes. In the church, yes. In a symphony, no. He stands up and he breaks the wall between the audience and the, in the orchestra. And he says, Oh, Freunde, nicht diese Töne. Oh, friends, not these notes. Sondern lasst uns angenehmer anstimmen. Let's, let's find something nicer to talk about. And then he takes Schiller's Ode to Joy, which is a quintessential Enlightenment poem. And Schiller was his friend as well. And he sets that to music. 
And he says, he, he has, within the context of his time, he's seen Napoleon rise and fall, he's seen the end of the Enlightenment as he sees it, and he says, I cannot leave this earth without making this statement. You have to remember the ideals that were given to us during the Enlightenment. So that's an example of a composer stating a problem, being empathetic with his audience in the first three movements. But compassion, as I looked it up, of course, when I was asked to talk, I thought, God, what's the difference between compassion and empathy? <laughs> and it, it's the desire to help. And in that symphony, as with many works, Beethoven says, here's my empathy in the first three movements, and here's my compassion in the final movement. He extends his arm and offers a solution. And it's as great a solution to that problem as has ever been. And it's why, the, you know, look at what's happening nowadays in politics. It's why the Ninth Symphony is still important. But thank you for the question. Brilliant, thank you. Hey Alex, um, I am just wondering, I have to know this, um, what kind of music do you like to dance to? Oh, <laughs> it, it, te it depends on my state. Well, there's Jane Watson over there. She likes to dance to music as well. She, she busted her knee. She, uh, Jane Watson is the CEO of the foundation here. And uh, uh, just uh, welcome, Jane. Um, anyway, it's not about you, Jane, but she busted her knee dancing just a week ago. I was watching. She went, oh, great song. Ow, my knee. <laughs> No, I love, I love dancing to all different kinds of music. It, it, it really depends on my state of inebriation. But um, uh, I, I would say that as a general rule, if I'm going to dance, it would be pop music. I like, you know, whatever's on the charts at the moment. Um, and uh, I like Latin music as well. I've always loved Latin music since I was a kid. I play jazz piano, and it's it just the kind of mixture between African rhythms and then the, the jazz harmonies has always just worked for me. Um, but yeah. You know, chart music, kind of like everyone else. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? Well, listen, uh, can I just say thank you for having me here this morning, and thank you all for coming.